Okay, diffraction. <clears throat> you might say, well, hey, we talked about diffraction in chapter 17. Is it similar to what we did there? The answer is yes. <laughs> We're going to go a little deeper, a little further. What's diffraction? It's the bending of waves around uh, obstacles or the edges of an opening, like we talked about in chapter 17. The Huygens principle is used to, to try and get a handle mathematically on what these things do. You can think, if you've just got um, an opening, so this is an, uh, a wall containing a doorway. So this is a, there's a lot of red and blue inside of that opening, but it's just an opening. It's a single slit that I made reference to earlier when we talked about the video demonstration. If you consider this, this slit to, cons to have several sources of light, each propagating out individually. So this is the light propagating out from source one, this is the light propagating out from source two, etc. Then you can get the shape of the overall waveform that passes through there. And so every point in a wavefront acts as a source of tiny wavelets that move forward at the same speed as the wave. The wavefront at a later instant is the surface that's tangent to the wavelets. So you're talking about all these little wavelets, and this uh, wavefront is, uh, is tangent to all those wavelets. So if, as we talked about in chapter 17, if the wavelength lambda is small compared with the width of this opening, then you don't get as much diffraction. Those small wavelengths just kind of head straight through and don't bend very much around the corners. You might remember uh, the case where we're talking about the band that was uh, coming along the street and what instrument do you hear first? Is it the piccolo or the bass drum? And the answer is the bass drum. It has a long wavelength and its wavelength becomes uh, perhaps comparable to the sizes of the obstacles and it bends around those corners a lot better. So this is a larger value for the wavelength uh, divided by the width and more diffraction. So the extent of diffraction increases as the ratio of the wavelength to the width of the opening decreases. We'll use, in this diagram, we're using W to represent the width of the opening. That's this here. Later, we'll use uh, capital D as we did in chapter 17. All right, so the curious thing about diffraction is that with only a single slit, you get something that looks like a two-slit interference pattern. So if you've got no diffraction, if you're just thinking about a shotgun and you shoot it through this, then, then all of the impacts are going to be along a line. That's not what happens here. We've got a wave. And because of this diffraction, you, you definitely have a central bright fringe but then you see other bright fringes to the side. So this will be the m equals zero bright fringe. And this is the uh, m equals one dark fringe. And what we're going to actually focus on are these dark fringes. Turns out they're easier to deal with than the bright fringes for this diffraction pattern. But let's not worry about that. Let's think about these, the locations of these dark fringes, these guys here. All right, five uh, sources of Huygens wavelets. Um, this is the midpoint, the central bright fringe. The first dark fringe. We're going to get destructive interference in the following way. We're dividing up it into wavelength, wavelets. And so what you see is that this wave and this wave 
are off by half a wavelength. So we're going to expect destructive interference from those two. And then similarly, these guys will get destructive. Will, will be off by half a wavelength, and we'll get destructive interference between those. And you look at various pairs, and that's what you end up with, is destructive interference and a dark fringe. Now, if you do the math, you get that for dark fringes, so now remember, this is what we're talking about, is dark fringes here, for diffraction, single slit diffraction. So we're not in Kansas anymore. It's not a double slit. It's a single slit that produces a diffraction pattern, similar to an interference pattern, but, but different. And it's a slit of width D. What you get for destructive interference and these dark fringes that I told you that we we're going to focus on is M times lambda over D. It looks like the condition for constructive interference for a two-slit pattern. But a couple of things are different here. Instead of D, in, in the case of the double slit, so here's the double slit. For the double slit, little d was the separation between the two slits. Now, we don't have two slits. We just have a single slit. And capital D represents the width that slit. So the width of the slit here goes here. M is 1, 2, 3. We don't get any M equals 0 for dark. So this is the M equals 0. I'm sorry. M equals 1. This is also M equals 1. M equals 2. M equals 2 etc. So they're evenly spaced out, but without a dark one in the center, it turns out, for diffraction. You can go back and look at concept 17-6, which did this, uh, the same thing, except we only went to the first minimum. We got the angle between here and here. We focused on, I'm sorry, this is m equals 1 for here and here. I mislabeled it. Um, this is m equals 1, m equals 1, m equals 2, m equals 2, um, etc. In, in this concept, 17-6, we just looked at the m equals 1 on either side. And what we had was that the sine of theta was lambda over d. Go back and you'll see that I'm telling you the truth. <laughs> So now we're actually extending it to m equals 2, 3, 4, 5, etc. So which of the following statements best explains why the diffraction of sound is more apparent than the diffraction of light under most circumstances? Well, let's think about it a little bit. You shine a flashlight through a door, and there's not much bending of the light around that doorway. Why is that? Well, think about the wavelength of light versus sound. Way, the sound of my voice has some um, wavelengths that are about a meter or so um, in, in wavelength. What about the light from your flashlight when shining through the door? Well, its wavelength is 500 nanometers. It's, just, it's incredibly tiny. And so you can't possibly expect to see much diffraction in our everyday life for light because the wavelength is so small. You'd need wavelengths that are comparable to what to, to us here in order to see that diffraction for visible light. But wavelengths of a meter or so is not visible radiation. <laughs> it's radio waves. So radio waves do bend around corners, but you can't see them. So what's the answer? Why is diffraction of sound more apparent in our everyday lives? than the diffraction of light under most circumstances. Well, it's not the transverse versus longitudinal. Uh, it's not this either. What matters really um, 
the speed of sound, it doesn't, the speed doesn't matter either. The speed of sound and, and light don't matter. What does matter is the wavelength of light is considerably smaller than the wavelength of sound. So in the demos that we showed earlier for interference, we're talking about tiny, tiny uh, slit separations. And in the demo we'll do for this part, we'll use very, very tiny slit widths as well. All right. Uh, concept four, state the angular condition for the first diffraction minimum for light passing through an aperture of diameter D. Compare again with uh, concept 17-6. You remember this number, it's 1.22. And uh, we talked about that, that first diffraction minimum for sound going through a circular aperture. And for a circular aperture, we had a 1.22. For just a slit, a long narrow slit, we just had one here. So sine theta was lambda over d. Um, so it's exactly the same as it was before. So if you learned it before, you've got it now. Um, and what we're talking about here, through a circular aperture, so we're passing light through this, this circular aperture here of diameter d, capital D, then the angle given by this equation is, gives the, the angular distance between the center of this spot on the screen and the first minimum in the diffraction pattern. All right, so a demo of this. You can actually demonstrate this. This is a demonstration of single slit diffraction. When a laser beam, this is a, I'm putting my hand in the beam here. This laser beam is incident on this circular dial that allows me to dial in the width of a slit through which the laser beam passes. So it's passing through this slit of various widths that I'll show you and then having passed through the vertical slits uh, produces a pattern on the screen here. So the, the, the width uh, and what you see in this pattern is a central bright spot and then dimmer spots to either side. This is called the M equals zero maximum, the M equals one on either side of that, M equals two, et cetera. With, uh, a constructive or destructive interference, namely a dark spot uh, at the edge of each bright spot. So this is for a slit width of 0 0.02 millimeters. If we move to 0 0.04 millimeters, what you see is a pattern that's tighter with uh, bright spots that are less wide. So as we increase the slit width, this is 0 0.08, the pattern gets even tighter. And then for 0 0.16, a pattern that's very, very tight. We can also do the same with circular apertures. So this is a circular, instead of being a slit through which the laser beam is pointed, this is a circular aperture. The laser beam is incident on a hole and, and blocked from passing outside the hole and only goes through that hole. And what you see here is a pattern with a central bright spot in the middle, but then rings around it that are reminiscent of the uh, dots that appeared in the, in the single slit pattern. This is a very important pattern, the, the pattern produced by a circular aperture, and it's important in, in resolving stars and has uh, relevance to the Rayleigh criterion where you have a central dot that, uh, to, to resolve two stars, you have to take into account this diffraction pattern from the aperture. This is a smaller aperture. The earlier aperture was 0 0.2 millimeters, and this is 0 0.4. It may or may not be visible on the camera. It's a very, very small um, diffraction pattern.
from that circular aperture. So that is diffraction patterns from single slits and circular apertures. Okay, a uh, quick correction. When I changed the dial from 0 0.2 millimeters to 0 0.4 millimeters, I said it was a, a smaller aperture. In fact, it was a larger aperture. But what we saw in moving from 0 0.2 millimeter aperture of the circular aperture diameter uh, to 0 0.4 is that the rings got tighter together. So that's exactly the same thing that we saw when we increased the slit width. As we get a, a wider and wider slit width in the earlier part of the demo, the, the wider the width was, the, the tighter the fringes, the closer the fringes became. And one thing we did see in that, uh, in, in this particular demo, was that the, we saw the diffraction pattern that was evident in the, very fir the first demo that we showed um, a couple of sections ago. Remember in the, in the demo we saw, in the first demo, we saw something like this, a bright fringe in the middle uh, and then little subdivisions. And so these uh, small fringes were from the two slit pattern. And these uh, larger fringes were from the single slit pattern. So in the, the, the very first part of the, the demo, we had, I didn't really talk about this in the demo, but this was a dark fringe, the M equals one dark fringe here and here. And then M equals two here and here. So that is the, um, <coughs> Excuse me. That's this relationship here, where we have the bright and the dark fringes that are covered by this, this concept are, are given by this equation here, and you saw them on the, on the screen. <coughs> then also in the demo, we saw <coughs> this pattern with that first minimum located by this equation here, sine theta is 1.22 lambda over d. We weren't able to actually demonstrate that for sound, but it's, it's easily demonstrable for light. <coughs> okay, and that's it. <laughs>